And what a glorious morning this is this morning uh, to have all of you guys here. Uh, the Lord has been truly gracious to us. So I hope that uh, all of you are enjoying all the festivities this weekend. It's been a fun weekend so far, not so much for me because I haven't been feeling well, but up here at the church it has been. Um, the holiday season is just starting to take off, and we have just two more Sundays until we begin Advent. And if you're like a lot of the people in my Facebook feed, then uh, you probably already got your Christmas tree up and you probably already started watching the Hallmark Channel. And uh, it seems to me that Christmas gets a little bit earlier every year, and I, for one, am not upset about that. Uh, I'm a believer that the world could use more Christmas spirit, uh, and even if it does start in October. That's all right. It's good with me. However, as you know, we've got a few things to celebrate before we get to Christmas. And we don't want to overlook these important things. Today at IHBC is our day of thankfulness. We started Friday evening with a Women Together DIY sign making event. Had a big crowd of ladies gathered for fellowship. They had a great time and were thankful for the fellowship and the deepening and meaningful relationships that the Lord is providing in fellowships like Women Together. Today, among the things we're thankful for and celebrating that we should never overlook is our veterans as we celebrated. What a blessing they are, and what a blessing it is to have so many veterans in our congregation. I am so thankful for every one of you, for the courage, the sacrifice, and the humility that you model for us. These are great virtues demonstrated that in so many ways reflect the person and work of Jesus Christ. So thank you guys. We are truly thankful for you. Also today, uh, immediately after church, we're having our Thanksgiving meal. It's our monthly potluck, and we'll continue our day of thankfulness. And I encourage all of you guests, you're all welcome as well. Uh, please, come and give thanks to the Lord for all his goodness with us. This morning, we're continuing in Ephesians 6. Last week, Paul told us that all the brokenness and sin and death and so much of what we see manifesting in our world and our lives, it's actually caused by things that we can't see caused by deeper realities playing out in the spiritual realm. Having called us to perceive this spiritual realm, Paul likened what we're up against to a battle. We saw three things. Paul made clear that we live in the midst of an invisible spiritual world. He also told us to dress for battle, to take up the full armor of God and fight spiritual darkness. He explained the weapons of spiritual warfare that he's given to us, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of gospel peace, the shield of faith, and the helmet of salvation. And today, in Ephesians 6, verses 18 to 20, Paul's going to follow up all that he's been saying about spiritual battle by bringing us to a final crescendo, both a crescendo of the book of Ephesians and also a crescendo of the means for spiritual battle. This final crescendo, the resolution and parting word Paul leaves us with is pray. Today we'll learn that communion with God in prayer is of primary importance. As one commentary says, prayer is last in sequence, but first in prominence. Paul opened Ephesians in chapter 1 with a command to pray. He prayed that his readers might know, that we might be enlightened to know, the hope and the riches and power that are ours in Christ. Now Paul draws the last of his instruction to a close here in chapter 6 with a command, again, that we should pray. In this we see that prayer bookends all that Paul's written in this letter, because, as in all of life, Paul shows us that everything should be couched in prayer. All of life, every aspect, every thought, every emotion, should be taken captive to God and saturated by prayer. Prayer must blanket every spiritual battlefield. This makes absolute sense when you survey the New Testament. In the book of Acts, we see not just the beliefs of Christians in the early church. We see the actions of these Christians. We see how they lived. We see they did a great number of things, but what's uniformly present in all the things we see is prayer. All things were asked of God in prayer. All things were committed to God in prayer. All things were done prayerfully, and all praise was given to God for all things in prayer. 
We see, as John MacArthur says, that prayer is the breath of the Christian life. Prayer is the air the Christian breathes. The need to come before God forces its way upon the Christian. You don't have to try to breathe. Air makes you breathe. It's instinctive. It's involuntary. It's inherent in us. And to live without prayer is to spiritually suffocate. For the believer, prayer is the inhale of the spiritual life. In this world, we find ourselves submerged in this broken existence, drowning in sin, in spiritual darkness, like living as if we're underwater, having a lifeline to God in prayer. We have an inherent need to come up for air. Prayer is no optional activity. To live without prayer is to spiritually suffocate. Paul here concludes the letter to the Ephesians and all he said, all he said about God's power toward believers and God's grace and love and Christ's works for us and God's wisdom for Christian living, Paul ends this all with a command to pray, prayer being the culmination of all that he said. Both the spiritual riches and the spiritual battles are all commanded of God to be couched in the context of prayer. The spiritual battle all the means for fighting the spiritual battles in the world, all the weapons, all of the wisdom, all of the perseverance, it's all amiss if it's not in the context of prayer. So let's get back into the text. We'll start in verse 10. We'll read the section all together as a whole, and then I'll pray for us, and we'll talk about the importance of prayer in our lives. Beginning in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 of the matchless, inspired, and inerrant word of God, the Apostle Paul writes, Finally, being strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that my words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the gift that is prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together in your sight this morning and to unite in prayer and in opening up your word and in sitting before you. Father, we pray that we would sit humbly under it, that we would receive it, that we would be changed by it. It's by the aid of your spirit and in the matchless authority of your son, Jesus Christ, to you, Father, we pray. Amen. All right. So Paul's been talking about the spiritual realities of our existence. He's been outlining the means for spiritual battle. He named all the weapons. And now he's saying, but in all of that, pray. In regards to prayer, the first thing that Paul commands is that we should pray always. He says prayer should be ceaseless. Prayer should be our first approach and our final response to all circumstances. No spiritual battle is fought well without prayer. We're in a battle that we can't fight alone. We can't fight unarmed. We have to be completely dependent on and in step with God. We have to talk to God. We have to take direction from His Word. We have to be prayerfully obedient to His will. It's possible that you may, by the grace of God, be delivered from a bad situation or a circumstance. You may receive a tremendous blessing without an ounce of prayer. But we have to know that that's purely by the grace of God. 
When we misunderstand this, prosperity can be a curse if it leads us to the belief that we don't have great need of God. But peace, in being firmly planted in God's will, is the blessing that comes from constantly being in communion with Him. Spiritual battles, just as all of life, must be thoroughly blanketed in prayer. And be warned, it's very easy to believe that because things go well for us, that we're in God's will. To go through life as a believer thinking that we're being obedient to God and that we sit squarely in His will because things appear to be going well for us. But if prayer is an afterthought, if it's moved to the background and it's not seen as crucially necessary or as something maybe you'll get to when you have the time, slowly but surely, a small degree at a time, if you haven't been communing and conversing with God, you'll find you've wandered from the path. It's impossible to be in step with God if we are not in communion with God. We have to depend on Him. The failure to be constantly dependent on God, a dependence which finds itself manifested and expressed in prayer, sin. It's dangerous. It should come as no surprise if you find it's hard to pray when it's something that you regularly don't do. It's awkward to talk with someone that you don't regularly talk to. It's work. You have to reestablish a relationship. You have to reestablish communication. If you don't like prayer, I hope you'll examine your heart. You should pray to God that He would give you a heart that loves and longs to commune with Him. Because if you neglect and forsake communion with God here on earth, and if spending time with God is not something that you presently long for and enjoy, you have to question whether it's something that you'd find eternal joy in spending with Him forever. Then a life of spiritual battle, where we're called to pray at all times, we need to understand that prayer is never an option. Even if our battle is with sin, and our sin makes us question whether God still loves us, in light of the things we've done, when our sin makes us feel unworthy of going to God in prayer, Prayer is truly what we need the most. And for us, rightly enduring battle and rightly receiving a blessing, enduring grief or rightly receiving joy, all things should start and end with God and in communion with Him. Whatever difficulty we have, whatever joy we have, whatever sin we have, in tragedy, trial, and triumph in every aspect of life, we live prayerfully in communion with God. All of life's troubles, they grow up from the same seedbed that leads to lack of prayer. It's a product of self-exaltation and sin. And the lack of prayer, it's that outgrowth of an overconfidence and a belief in our own abilities, rather than an absolute dependence on God. And our troubles, they spring forth out of a wrong relationship with God. Until we return to communion with God, there's nothing but prayer that's going to remedy these troubles. All of the Christian life is dependent on prayerful communion with God. And that's why Paul here, he uses the word all four times in the text. He says, pray at all times, with all prayer, with all perseverance, for all the saints. When Paul says pray at all times, he's referring to the frequency and the constancy of prayer. Prayer should be ceaseless. We should pray in all things. In the Psalms, they show us clearly that in blessing and in good and in sorrow and in grief and in evil and in sin, in all things, the person of God should go to God in prayer. And prayer isn't confined to a time or a place. We don't wait till we lay our head down at the end of the night or wait until we go into the sanctuary for worship or confession or until we're alone in private in our prayer closet. Prayer takes place in all those places. Paul says all of the Christian life should be lived in prayer. Paul goes on to say, pray with all prayer. By this he's referring to the variety of our prayers. 
Paul says, pray all kinds of prayers. Pray public prayers, verbal, silent, planned, spontaneous, confessional, group prayers. These prayers are the orienting practice and the directing and fueling force of the Christian life. J.I. Packer points out that Christians in revival are accordingly found living in God's presence, attending to his word, feeling acute concern about sin and righteousness, rejoicing in the assurance of Christ's love and their own salvation, spontaneously constant in worship and tirelessly active in witness and service, fueling all these activities by praise and prayer. All of the Christian life is saturated in prayer. Not just personal prayers, but next Paul says, make supplication for all the saints. He says, pray for your brothers and your sisters. Paul says, being alert, meaning seeing the spiritual realities at work around you, seeing the needs and concerns and troubles of those around us, pray for all the saints. Your brothers and your sisters, they need your prayers. Paul calls us to pray not merely for ourselves. If we go and look at Paul's prayers and see how he prays. He gave us two of his own personal prayers right here in this letter to the Ephesians. Back in chapter 1 and verse 15, see how Paul prays for others. He says, I ceaselessly give thanks to God and pray for you. And we see, first of all, Paul's thankful for his brothers and sisters. Paul gives God praise for them. And these aren't perfect people he's speaking about by any stretch of the imagination. They're sinners saved by grace, just like you and me. The Christians all around us who we regularly knock elbows with, it happens. But he loves them. He gives thanks for them, for their faith. He prays that they'd have eyes to see the battlefield around them, to see the power of God towards them, to see the chariots of fire arrayed, as their allies, and see their enemy clearly, that flesh and blood is not their enemy. Meaning the other brothers and sisters in the church are not their enemies, and that he himself is not their enemy. Because you can trust that Paul knows far better than you and I that conflict happens in the church. You see him in conflict with Peter in the book of Galatians in conflict with Mark in the book of Acts, with the Corinthians in his letters to them. You see in Corinth, the church was divided into factions, groups aligning against each other over singular allegiance to certain church leaders, some with Apollos, some with Peter, some with Paul. Paul tells them, stop it. All of them are yours, and all of you are Christ's. Division and infighting in the body of Christ, it's no new thing. Even within the body of Christ, Christians can get to thinking that our adversaries are flesh and blood. And Satan and our flesh, they turn us against one another. While it may be that some of us have differences or even we sin against one another, we are not one another's enemies. We need to pray for one another, fight for one another in love, Rather than turn against one another, we need to turn into one another. As the Bible teaches clearly, Christians are people who strive to outdo one another in kindness, who in humility count others more significant than themselves, who look not only to their own interests, but to the interests of others, who love with abandon, knowing that love covers a multitude of sins. That kind of love, it begins with a trust in God that comes through prayer, a love for our brothers and sisters that is fostered in praying for them. Because the simple reality is that when we pray for our brothers and sisters, we become less preoccupied and fixated on ourselves, our desires. We become deeply concerned for them. We see ourselves as united rather than individuals, individuals merely gathered. Jesus taught us we pray, Our Father who art in heaven, not my Father. Our relationship in the body of Christ, it's familial, is not individual. Our prayers should not merely be for ourselves, 
but for all the saints, because the saints are Christ's body. Self-centeredness is not only sinful, it misunderstands God's whole purpose in salvation. God saves his people to be a corporate body, not a scattered collection of individuals. When we fail to understand this, we fail to honor God's purpose in saving us. Christ prayed, Father, make them one, not Father, make them a scattered multitude. And the body of Christ, we are one. We pray for the many who are in Christ, one with us together, united in him. Lastly, in verse 19, Paul says, pray also for me. Paul says, I need your prayers. And he reminds us, we not only need to pray for ourselves and to pray for our brothers and sisters, we need to pray for our leaders. As Paul so clearly demonstrates for us, Christian leaders desperately need prayer. Gospel boldness, living with the challenges and opposition that comes with being a public proclaimer of the word of God, a leader of God's people. It's unspeakably difficult, physically and emotionally taxing. It's just a fact of life that when you speak and lead boldly, you attract opposition, particularly in the spiritual realm. There's a quote that's attributed to a number of the most brilliant people in history. It says, the best way to avoid criticism is to say nothing, do nothing, and be nothing. Because it's known that when you stand boldly, resolvedly, you do important things, none more important than the work of gospel ministry. You attract vehement spiritual enemies. One example that I call to mind frequently, my seminary president, for instance, Dr. Albert Moeller. Today, he's unquestionably considered one of the greatest and most revered leaders in the evangelical church. He stands among an elite group of Southern Baptist leaders. He regularly appears on Fox News and on CNN and gives the Bible's position on any number of issues. He's looked to for guidance throughout the evangelical world. But in 1993, when he became the president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary at the age of 33, he inherited a school that was completely out of order. The flagship seminary of the Southern Baptist Convention was in shambles. It was an utter disaster. Muller was called to pick up the pieces, to right the ship, to bring the school back into line with the principles upon which the SBC and the school itself were founded. The gospel, missions, Biblical fidelity, sound theological training, flourishing faith. Being a man faithful to his calling, committed to the task, trusting in the Lord, he set himself to the task of bringing about necessary change. From the very first moment the changes began, dark forces arrayed against him for battle. He was treated with contempt. The students despised him. Their hate was so sincere that they hung him in effigy in the school's lawn. Two years into the project, the faculty rallied against him and issued a vote of no confidence calling for him to be fired. Now Muller has told the story many, many times. How he and Mary, his wife, they sat on the floor of their bedroom and they bawled. And in prayer, they threw themselves on the mercy of God. And for the first several years of his tenure, he was hated. But he stayed faithful to the calling. He had a tremendous number of people rallying in prayer for him. And today, the seminary and Al Mohler are two of the most respected Christian institutions in the evangelical world. And he's still hated. But not by students anymore by opponents of the gospel. Al Mohler still doesn't go anywhere without a bodyguard. Because today he's hated nationally for the biblical principles he's so prominently defended. The thousands of conservative gospel ministers that the seminary trains every year. This example comes to my mind frequently because this is the person I learned leadership from. His wife taught dandy. These are people we look to as a model. Follow them as they follow Christ. We know that being ministers of the gospel means 
We know what that means. We beg for your prayers. We learn firsthand that church leaders may suffer as ambassadors in chains to make known the mystery of the gospel. Returning to the text, this was no surprise to the people of Ephesus as they read this letter from Paul. They cried over Paul as he took leave of them for the last time. Saw it in Acts 20. They knew fully that he was likely to be executed, like Jesus before him, for the gospel message that he had stood so strong to preach to them. And Paul here, he sits in chains as he writes this. And you'd think that in writing from prison, from confined quarters, he'd be asking for some kind of help or for some small creature comforts. And he doesn't. Yes, instead, for their prayers. Not that they would pray for his deliverance, or his safety, or for his comfort, but immobilized and imprisoned, Paul asked for prayer that he would remain bold in making known the mystery of the gospel. He prays the gospel would be clear, and that he would not falter in making it known. He prays that any other aspect of himself that God would remove from inhibiting the advance of the gospel that his flesh and fear and frustration and all the things the old man would prefer would be no hindrance to the clear proclamation of the word of God, that God would embolden him in the spirit, advance the gospel, and make him small so that Christ would become large. Paul was focused on his God-given mission, not his self-centered concerns. Paul demonstrates, as Robert Law put it, Prayer isn't getting man's will done in heaven, it's getting God's will done on earth. Paul says to the Christians of Ephesus, pray for me, I need your prayers. Like Paul, your leaders need your prayers. You can trust that if Paul needed prayers, your leaders need your prayers. Your pastor, our church leaders, our local network and association leaders, convention leaders, these people need your prayers. Scripturally, do you long for revival and the resurgence of Christianity in America? You need to be praying for the leaders that God has raised up to guide his church. A.W. Pink points out that while many are likely praying for a worldwide revival, it would be more timely and even more scriptural to pray that he would raise up and thrust forth the laborers who would fearlessly and faithfully preach those truths which are calculated to bring about a revival. And Charles Spurgeon, amazing preacher that he was, he said, Oh, men and brethren, what would this heart feel if I could but believe that there were some among you who would go home and pray for a revival among men whose faith is large enough and their love fiery enough to lead them from this moment to exercise unceasing intercessions that God would appear among us and do wondrous things here as in times of former generations. Because it's no secret that where a great gospel ministry is set to take place, forces of darkness array against it. Even Spurgeon, in the early years of his ministry, at the age of 22, he was a lead pastor and he was so hated by the establishment, likewise by enemies of the gospel. He was attacked on both sides, by the church and by the world. He endured horrific slander and opposition. One Sunday while preaching to thousands in the Surrey Gardens Music Hall, a heckler was bent on disrupting his preaching, and he yelled, Fire! Fire! He sent the congregation into a panic. As they stampeded to exit the building, seven were killed, 28 severely injured. Spurgeon was never the same after that. His wife Susanna wrote that, My beloved's anguish was so deep and violent that reason seemed to totter in her throne. We sometimes feared that he would never preach again. For Spurgeon, it was as Matt Chandler, who's my favorite preacher. Matt Chandler, by the grace of God, overcame stage three brain cancer. He says, everyone wants a Paul-like ministry. No one wants Paul-like pain. Your preachers and your leaders need your prayer. Your church needs your prayer. History reveals that revival always begins with prayer. It's never bereft of strong, God-called leaders and proclaimers of his word 
you study all the great revivals of church history, this is what you'll find. Those leaders appointed of God need fervent prayer for strength and boldness and perseverance in the face of overwhelming spiritual opposition. The church needs far more prayer. Famed 19th century pastor A.T. Pearson, he pointed out that there's never been a spiritual awakening in any country or locality that didn't begin in united prayer. Prayer inflames and tunes and focuses the heart of the people of God on the things of God. Where the people of God have hearts that are deeply attuned to God and humbly submitted to the will of God, God is greatly glorified and glorious things happen in his name. Brothers and sisters, Paul's already told us in this letter, we are blessed with every spiritual blessing and have been granted the weapons for spiritual battle. Let's stop praying to God to bend to our wills, if that be the case. Let's start praying that God would bend us to His. Let's unite in ceaseless prayer. Let's pray for one another. Let's pray for our leaders. Let's pray that He'd shelter and protect and embolden His people in spiritual battle. That in the face of struggle by His grace, He'd unite us and make us one. That He'd bring us to an understanding of who we are and all we've been given. Let's give ourselves to the kind of communion with him that he rightfully deserves that would bring clarity and focus for us that our hearts would be tuned to his will and our enemy would be made clear. And it would be made clear that our brothers and sisters and our allies are not our enemies. That we'd exercise a prayerful care for one another. Call on God to strengthen our church and our leaders. You want to see revival in Great County? Put on the full armor of God Lock shields with your brothers and sisters. Fall on your knees in the presence of God and align yourselves to Him in prayer. Today, if this is you, if you've longed for this communion with God, if you've been awakened to the joy of being united to Him in Christ, if you're ready to fall on your knees before Him in prayer, to take up the full armor of God, stand for Him before men in the righteousness of God that can be yours in Christ, Come on and take that first step of faith this morning. Come on up here. Let it be known you're ready to align yourself with the will of God. You're ready to make Christ the Lord of your life. And if you're ready to commit to membership, if you're ready to unite with us, to prayerfully fight for your brothers and sisters here, to align with us in prayer, and to covenant with us in membership, I invite you to come and join us as we prayerfully fight to defend our church against the spiritual darkness and lead one another into prayerful submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever that next step is for you, I'll be up front when you're ready.